Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here with Daphne Kohler, the Chief Computing Officer of Calico, which many of you may have heard of as a computational science lab dedicating to extending life and ending the problems and diseases associated with, age, well, with aging at Google. Um, but Daphne, of course, has also had a very fascinating career. She was also the co-founder of Coursera. And um, I'm really excited to talk with you. Thank you, Lisa. So give, give me your, just your quick version. Why Google is a data and information company that wants to be everything. Why does Google really care about extending life and aging? I think Google is interested in some of the very large societal problems that uh, we can help make the world better. And aging is one of those problems that uh, society is going to be facing more and more over the coming years. The number of people over the age of 65 by in a couple years will exceed the number of people under the age of five. Um, and we, and the care for people as they get older and as they get sick, the costs are just mounting both to themselves, to their families, and to society. So how can we allow people to live healthier? So the, the initiative raises so many questions. One, I, I used to cover data privacy when I was at the Wall Street Journal. And I'm wondering, do you guys have discussions about you're producing this massive amount of data? And you'll tell us during the conversation about some of your fascinating experiments that you told me about. Uh, but part of them is taking biology and turning it into data and computing on it. Um, so do, do you guys have discussions about commingling this biological data with data Google collects from your smartphone, your voice, your home? Do you talk about that? That's definitely not uh, what we're doing. We're focused on the design of better therapeutics and our work right now is at the, what we call the preclinical phase, which primarily uses model organisms um, that includes cell lines and mice and worms and they don't have privacy issues. <laughs> worms don't have privacy issues. No. Uh, so tell me about, you know, you, you know your research is uh, it's unpublished. And I was very excited to hear about some of it, especially because Calico is known to be so secretive. So um, tell us, tell us about what, what, what you've done with mice, your little mouse, quantified mouse world, right. and your future research. So first of all, let me say that I don't think we're secretive as much as we don't like to talk about work until it's complete and we know what we want to say. So unlike uh, some people who want to talk about stuff that's ready in three years, we like to talk about stuff that's ready now. Um, the mouse project is actually an interesting one. It's a long-term project, and I can talk about where we're at. It's uh, trying to get a sense of the aging trajectory of a mammalian organism. So I think it's maybe one of the largest aging experiments ever done. It's 750 mice uh, that are in five different arms of caloric restriction. One arm gets to eat as much as they want, kind of like people, and the other five, ha the other four arms have a restricted diet. And then we measure every single thing about these mice from birth to death, um, starting from, oh, and by the way, caloric restriction is because it's the one intervention that's been repeatedly demonstrated to extend lifespan across multiple species. Daphne told me she also practices caloric uh, restriction herself. <laughs> not not Wait, really, but her. trying a little bit. <laughs> Um, there was actually a really interesting study just a few uh, months ago that was published that showed that even a small reduction in the caloric intake can have a significant reduction in inflammatory markers and other things that plague aging people. So I think there's some interesting signs there even in humans. Is that that's a reduction in just what you would normally eat? Yeah. So they tried to get people to reduce their caloric intake by 25%. That didn't work. I think the average was about 11 to 14%. I don't remember the exact number, but even that seemed to have had a significant impact, not only in terms of weight loss, which is what you would expect, but also in terms of various biomarkers that uh, correspond, for instance, to inflammation, which are quite interesting. So I think there's a lot of science behind caloric restriction. The problem is it's just so darn hard. So, <laughs> uh, but anyway, these mice don't have a choice. Um, they get to live longer, we hope, because they're going to be under caloric restriction, although we'll, uh, the experiment will verify that. Um, and then where we measure everything from their genetics to RNA, proteins, metabolites. They go in these little metabolic cages um, once for a week every few months, and those things are really the quantified self uh, completely because they measure every breath that the mites take um, and every food pellet and every sip of water and where they are and how much they sleep and their body temperature and their body weight. And so you really measure everything about these mice, and it allows us to get potentially 
a feel for what's aging trajectories for mammalian organism look like. Are all of these organisms on the same trajectory? It's just that the ones that die earlier just traverse it faster uh, versus the ones that live longer just go more slowly? Or are there actual bifurcation points where organisms that live longer, individuals that live longer, just take a different fork in the road? And if so, how many forks are there? And what are the triggers that potentially might uh, force one fork in the road versus another? And can you detect even before the fork which, in, which individual is going to go on the long-lived fork or the short-lived fork? So, so there's you, a whole bunch of questions that we could potentially answer with an experiment like that. So you consider this like your quantified mouse universe? Yes. <laughs> it's like mouse reality TV. Mouse reality TV. And what, what are the most interesting questions that you think you can answer from this ex ongoing experiment? Well, so we haven't started to answer those questions because the mice are still about halfway through their life right now. I mean, that's one of the problems with aging experiments is that they take a really long time because you have to let the organism live out its lifespan. Um, but I think, like I said, to me, the question of what, how many trajectories of aging are there and what are the factors uh, that could lead an organism, a specific individual, to go down the potentially long-lived life trajectory versus short-lived of life trajectory? Are those genetic factors? Um, are those environmental factors? What role does diet play? And can we detect early which organism might live longer or shorter? Because that might allow us potentially a chance at an early intervention. So there's a lot of really fascinating things that this experiment could reveal. Now, you also have a forthcoming experiment that you haven't talked about. So I'd yeah. love to, um, for you to tell yeah. people about it, just to, if you can touch on it a little bit. So a few of our um, scientists ha are also looking at the mechanisms that underlie cellular aging. So for that, we're using yeast because there, it's a very easy organism to work with, and a lot of the basic biology of yeast is preserved all the way through mammalian cells. Turns out that as cells age, a lot of stuff begins to go wrong inside the cell. So the lysosome, for instance, which is this little organelle inside the cell that degrades proteins that are basically not functional, misfolded proteins. Um, the, the organelle loses its acidity and suddenly starts to not be as effective at degrading the proteins. So there's a lot of things that we don't know about that trajectory of, of the aging cell. So a few of our scientists, uh, Dan Gottschling and Scott McIsaac, are looking at the trajectories of aging cells and what environmental and genetic factors might cause cells, again, to age slowly or quickly. And the problem with that is that you need to watch these cells throughout their lifespan and you need to figure out how old each cell is and, and in order to do that without destroying the cell, you need to put them all under a microscope and you need to track individual cells. And that's really hard because to do this by hand or by eye rather, someone needs to sit there and watch hours and hours, thousands of hours of videos of dividing yeast cells, which is really not that interesting. So one of the things that we've done is work with them. Uh, one of my scientists, John Shu, has worked with them to create a, um, a basically a yeast tracker that allows us to figure out how old each yeast cell is. And uh, so then, is it, yeah. is it like, it's like computer vision basically. It's computer so vision. it's taking the same kinds of tools that yeah. we're seeing in robotics or in self-driving cars exactly. and looking and tracking yeast. Exactly. I, I, I want to jump, jump in with another question, which is, so, uh, you know, I think many people would agree that it's, it's fantastic that the mighty Google and companies like Google want to put money into, um, into, into social societal problems, but but we also there's also the question, or one might conclude that, um, you know, Sergey Brin and other wealthy Silicon Valley types are very interested in life extension. It's their personal priority. They want to live forever. So I'm, I'm curious for you. Do you, do you think that? How do you think about that? That um, the personal priorities of the leadership can get encoded into what what the future is. For example, you know, if they were living in a tropical country, maybe you, people like you would be studying tropical diseases instead of aging. Or um, you know, if it was about diseases of poverty, then maybe we would be studying obesity or things that affect people's quality of life at a younger age. 
So I can't speak to the motivation of the Google founders in setting this up because I wasn't there when this happened. To me, the big question is, is the endeavor worthwhile and is it going to help everybody? So if this was just to help a few people, this wouldn't be interesting to me and I would expect not to uh, pretty much anyone else at Calico. So to me, this is interesting because aging is actually a universal societal problem. It's not just a problem of you know the United States or Silicon Valley. It's a problem that What's the problem plagues everyone. Of wealthy countries because no, many not. people don't live to be that that old. Actually, it turns out it turns out that uh, even Africa is uh, moving towards a model where there's more people over the age of 65 than under the age of five. You think of Africa as a young people's country, but that's not true for a lot more years at this point. So it's it's actually a universal problem. And when you mentioned obesity, which is definitely a problem of well, poverty in the US is not actually a problem of poverty elsewhere in the right. world. Um, obesity is one of the major factors that we think give rise to an early onset of age-related diseases. So I think this is a fundamental societal question, and it's not just a Silicon Valley or even a first world question. Well, what about the question, though? I, someone told me recently that Google has published 60% of all papers in AI. That is just not true. It's not true? It might, no. Um, it might be true in the context of a particular conference or workshop, but that's just not true. Okay, okay, fair enough. But what, I, you know, I, I wanna push the question more, which is, uh, as these companies can throw resources at their mm -hmm. priorities, does it, does it cha change the course of research um, towards their own priorities, and are there any problems with that, or concerns about that? Well, I think that certainly because of the resources that not just Google, but Google, Facebook, Amazon, and others have poured into artificial intelligence has driven the field forward in drastic ways, but ways that are benefiting a lot of people. So the fact that you can now get sentences translated with very high accuracy, close to human accuracy in a lot of language pairs, that allows communication between different people to be easier and more natural. So I think that as long as those priorities are consistent and helpful to society, I think that's, that's really valuable. I, if you start going into directions that are detrimental, that begins to become a problem, but I'm not sure that that's the case at this point. Or that yeah, I know, that I know some academics have, complain, have complained about it, that uh, because they, they lose so much talent to these companies and you have a student who might do PhD research in one area and then now they're gonna go work on a self-driving car at Amazon or they're yeah. gonna work on something at Google, so. That is true. I mean, uh, academia has lost a lot of people to industry, I think, because there is so much more resourcing at industry for re re research of this type. There's more data, there's more compute power. Um, I think to, for a lot of academics, it's actually less about the money that they could earn in those industry opportunities, but really about the ability to do something that's really high impact, both in terms of the resources, but also in terms of you push out a product that could actually change people's lives. So you're not just doing, say, image recognition for your data set of, um, you know, a few thousands of images. You're actually helping people who are, you know, blind look with their phone and see what, uh, what and have their phone tell them right, what's or there. Or drive the cars of the future, yeah. or in the rare it's case, the solve aging. It's, it's the really impact. the impact. And the scale. And the scale. So. Um, I think you know one of the most interesting questions right now in science and in biology is how will data be brought to bear? Mm -hmm. I think there's there's more data in quantifying the genome than there is on yeah. all of YouTube, and all and CRISPR has a huge amount mm -hmm. of data. How would you say? What do you think is? This seems like the promise of the future. If you could tell me one thing now, where mm -hmm. computation has made a massive impact in our understanding of biology, what would be the biggest, the strongest data point right now? Well, so before we get to where computation has made an impact, let me first give you some numbers that really support the point that you just made, mm -hmm. which is I was not aware of this until recently of the, of the power of big data in biology really starting to come into fruition. So my favorite statistic along these lines is from a paper that was written in 2015 that tracks the number of human genomes sequenced per year, every year since the very first human genome in 2001. And if you draw that graph on, on a log scale with the number, with a year being the x-axis and the log number of genomes being the y-axis, you end up seeing a beautiful linear curve, which will remind most of you of Moore's law, except that it grows twice as fast as Moore's law. So depending on whether you believe that the projection for the next 10 years from 2015 to 2025 continues more slowly, which is just Moore's law or using historical trends, 
that the number that we will have by 2025 is between 100 million and 2 billion human genome sequence. So twice as fast as twice Moore's as Law. Twice as fast as Moore's Law. So think about that number and the possibility of big data to understand what it is about our genome that gives some people Alzheimer's and others not, makes some people obese in a certain diet and others not. The ability to really um, obtain insight into what is going to make some of us live healthier and how we might help the others, how we might help all of us go on the more healthy trajectory, I think that power is enormous. Um, and, and let me just add, that's only human genomes. It doesn't count microbiomes and metabolomes and proteomes and the stuff that comes off of our Fitbit or our Apple Watch or any of those huge data sources that are just starting to come into play. And I think the opportunities in this field are endless at this point. And this is really, I think biology and health are the next big data frontier. It's fascinating. So do you think that one day Google will compete with major pharmaceutical companies like Merck and Abvi? Well, I mean, I don't think Google com is going to compete in the pharmaceutical space, and even we at Calico are actually partnering with a pharmaceutical company because, specifically uh, with Abvi, because there's a lot of parts of the pharmaceutical production process that they're really good at, and we don't think we have a competitive edge. So, for instance, all the medicinal chemistry stuff they're amazing at, as just as one example. But I think as you start collecting really large amounts of data um, across different data modalities and you want to synthesize that into a picture of health versus disease and what drives certain people towards the healthy state versus the disease state, that's a place where I think Silicon Valley and tech and Google specifically really has a unique asset to offer. And I think by working together with biologists and health professionals, we can help make everyone healthier. Yeah. Tell us more about that partnership, what that looks like. So it's interesting. I mean, you see Google right partnering with these healthcare companies, which you know is very new. So this is a partnership that was uh, that that was very early on in the days of Calico, and I think came again from the recognition that uh, there's a lot that pharmaceutical companies do really, really well, but uh, there's a lot of synergies that could be obtained regarding. Are in the processes that go towards the kinds of targets, the kinds of directions that a pharmaceutical company might not normally think to follow. And so we ended up with a partnership where Google put in a certain amount of money and AbbVie put in a matching amount, and, and we collaborate on a certain set of, of interventions that are specifically related to age and age related diseases. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing to think about one day that your healthcare you know, might be delivered by Google. It's so strange to think about, actually. I'm not sure that healthcare, we've, I mean, healthcare will continue, I think, to be delivered by physicians and, and hopefully with more and more empowerment to individuals themselves. But the hope is that data will inspire uh, what healthcare gets delivered to the point that it's no longer, for instance, a one-size-fits-all health delivery, but rather something that allows the treatment that I get to be different from the treatment that you get because our genomes are different and our life histories are different, and that's going to require really big data to figure that out. And how close are we to that future where you and I present the same illness, but it actually turns out to be wildly different and our treatments are wildly different? That's already happening, especially in cancer, where the kinds of biomarkers that um, present in many cases as the same thing, as certain type of, say, breast cancer, and people have started to use molecular markers to sort of disentangle the origins and the sort of the, the pathophysiology of one type versus another, and different treatments are now given. That's what's called precision medicine. Yep. And I think we're moving towards that more and more, certainly in cancer, but I think we're also going to start see, seeing that in other diseases as well, specifically, for instance, it's pretty well recognized at this point that neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's is not one disease, that's probably multiple diseases with very different origins from different people. Will you guys partner with the government? I know there's a there's a massive moonshot happening in the US government mm -hmm. around quantify, getting a million people to quantify everything, and it's mm -hmm. a cancer moonshot. Yeah. W will you guys partner with them, and how do you feel about working with the government? 
Well, I mean, there's actually the cancer moonshot, and then there's also the the um, the one million uh, the one million veterans project, and there's a number of these. And actually, in many ways, the UK is ahead of the US because they have the UK Biobank, which has been going on for about five years and have has 500,000 people that have very deeply quantified information. They've agreed to let both their genetics and their phenotypes be used for research by any qualified researcher anywhere in the world. So and most of the data that you're a lot of the data you work with comes from UK citizens. Uh, this is the UK Biobank, and these are people who have opted in to allowing their data to be used by any researcher anywhere in the world, and obviously with appropriate privacy protections, which we are very careful about, as, as I expect are other people. But I think the US is now starting to put together some of these biobanks as well, and I think it's an amazing opportunity for people to be helpful in driving forward research and making um, people's health better. And do you also contribute your own data? Well, I've not yet been offered the opportunity to do that, but I think if there was such an effort, I would be happy to have my data be uh, <laughs> contributing to health research, I mean, uh, with appropriate privacy protection and anonymization. Yeah. I want to ask one last question about yeah. Coursera, since we yeah. didn't get to talk about it, which is there was a ton of excitement about online education. Now some of it seems to be waning. Uh, why, why do you think that it, that it waned a bit, and do you think that online courses are living up to their promise? I think it's a typical example of the Gartner hype cycle. I remember in 2012, uh, you know, Time Magazine or the New York Times Year of the MOOC, and uh, MOOCs are going to put universities out of business, which, by the way, I never agreed with nor saw, thought was a good idea. And then 2013, 12 months later, MOOCs have failed because universities are still around. It's like I, I, that, that disparity was just really, I think, weird. MOOCs, I think, are an online education is converging. Uh, slowly to a steady state of it's a really good way of offering education to certain subsets of students. So for instance, we have a lot of um, people who are continuing their education past their undergraduate or whatever first uh, set of degrees they got because we all know that the world around us is changing really, really quickly. So what you learned in school 15 years ago um, is probably not what the skill that you need today. Data science didn't exist as a profession 15 years ago. Um, and now it's the hottest profession ever. So I think over people, more people need education over time, but they don't have the option at the age of 35 with a mortgage and three kids and a job to go back to school and get another master's degree. So I think there is a real need for ongoing education for people throughout their lives, um, as well as in the developing world for the people who never had the access to a good education to give them an opportunity to get the skills that they need to, uh, to, to have a better life. And so I think there is a place for that, but it's not as a replacement to universities. Well, I wish we had more time to talk that through, but we are out of time. There's one, I'm supposed to give you a pop quiz. I was asked to give you a, Ooh, a pop quiz. You did where, not warn me about that. <laughs> I was told not to. Uh-oh. Uh, where I'm going to give you 10 things, and you're going to tell me if it, you think it's overrated or underrated. Oof. Okay. okay. Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin, overrated. Blockchain. Underrated. AI. Both. <laughs> <laughs> Two second elaboration. Uh, I think the it's what Bill Gates always said: the two-year potential versus the ten-year potential. I think people are grossly overestimating the general AI in in three years not going to happen, but the societal impact over many many different applications is going to be huge and increasing. Mm -hmm. Facebook. Um, overrated. Google. Um, also overrated. Honest answer. I like people give honest answers. Autonomous cars. Uh, underrated. All right, this one I know your answer, MOOCs. Uh, currently, I think underrated. Overrated a few years ago, now underrated. Uber. Overrated. CRISPR. Underrated. Genomics. Underrated. Thanks so much for your time.